I'm Dan. And I'm Simon. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article and we talk about what we find. Simon, what are we talking about this week? This week, Dan, we are talking about Cossipore. Cossipore. I will spell that for you. Now, what's interesting, actually, is the title of the article is spelled differently to the first usage of the word in the article. In the title... Bodes well, doesn't it? In the title, it's spelled... C O S S I P O R E. Right. And in the first instance of being used in the in the article, it's K A S H I P U R. Right. Okay. Do you want to guess what this cosipal is? Hmm. I. Oh gosh, I don't know. The when when you first said it, certainly sort of phonetically. Oh, here's our first guest of the podcast. I think it's a ambulance. It's coming for the podcast. It was dead on arrival. There we go. Yeah. Time of death. I, I'm, before I go any further, I might just let the readership know that um, yeah, it's, go a on. Slightly, it's a slightly different podcast this week because I'm not in my normal recording location, uh, namely um, at my, my home. Carad in... Galaton. <laughs> uh, Dan normally records from the home of the Woodland Elves. I do, normally, normally, which is why my Wi-Fi is so poor. But I, uh, I'm in London, actually, staying at a friend's house, and I brought my recording gear down. So I'm, uh, I'm recording, I'm coming to you live from from Westminster. And as such, there are probably going to be quite a few sort of random noises that you might hear. I'm afraid I did I did put bollards outside the flat and things, but I'm not sure uh, Westminster City Council are going to do a great deal. Fortunately, we have the best editor in the business we do. on the case. We do. So I'm sure I'm sure this is going to be, you know, super easy breezy beautiful cover girl if you can't make them disappear fergus just put like comedy noises over the top of yeah them. yeah like, exactly you know honk honk you know clown noises over the top of the motorbike i actually was saying before i answer your question i was saying to simon this might be the most sort of bizarre podcast recording setup i think i've had in a while simply because i'm i'm in a sort of spare room at a friend's house so uh, readers i'd like you to if you can just close your eyes and um, I'm going to create a word painting for you so you can really understand how I'm recording this. So I want you to imagine a double bed. Easy, easy. It's not getting yep, too raunchy. You. Yeah. I'm sitting at the end of the double bed with my legs flat out in front of me underneath... <laughs> the legs, rather, are underneath an ironing board... On the ironing board, I have managed to balance my microphone and laptop. Wow. I have my phone on the other bit of the ironing board where you'd normally put, you'd rest the iron, because that's how Simon and I, that's how we talk to each other. I do my audio off a separate thing, just in case my laptop has a hissy fit. And you know what? Actually, remarkably comfortable. I'm not doing too badly. Having said that, we've only been recording for a few minutes. Yeah, don't speak too soon. When we get to minute 50, I'm probably going to be in a world of pain, but that's all right. The Inspector Gadget setup will come to bite you, I'm sure. I mean, one of my favourite podcasts, The Greater Generation, they've recorded episodes in the bath before, Ooh. which I feel like as a setup would be a real... I mean, quite apart from the echo, just like getting... I'd be so nervous about having a recording equipment that close to that much water. You know, an ironing board, by comparison... Yeah, I don't. I think it would be the echo that would annoy me. Mm. Maybe we need to try this. I'd be up for a water episode where we were just in the tub. Yeah, let's do a water episode, like a water birth. I do have a pitch for you for later. Actually, in the episode, we'll come back to that. Put a pin in that one, Dan. I do. I, I have, I, there's a discussion I want to have, but first, I do want to quiz you on Cossipor and what you think it might be. Yeah. So when I was going to say when you first sort of said it, I was thinking Petricor. Oh, right, yeah. But however, now that you've clarified the spelling, very different. Yeah, it's not Greek-inspired, I'll it, say that much. Can I have a clue as to... It can be It can be pretty general. Is it a thing? It's a neighbourhood. It's a neighbourhood. What's it called again? Cossipor. Cossipor. I have no idea. Is it somewhere in... Oh, my gosh, I don't know. Southeast Asia? It is in South Asia. Uh. It is specifically in India. Right. Oh, now this is interesting, because if I'm not mistaken, next week, possibly Tuesday, is it's the 77th Independence Day for India. Oh, really? I think, because I had an email, from, I had an email at work discussing it, and, and the, the, the team that we have in India will be ta- won't be working that day. I think it's 77th. I could be completely wrong, but I see, I'm trying to sort of trawl through my brain because this email came in early this morning. Mm. But I'm fairly sure next... Oh, is it Wednesday or Thursday? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Anyway, 
or Tuesday. It's next week. And I think it's the, it's, it's, yeah, the 77th Independence Day for, for India. So this is a very interesting article to it. And this was, you know, as per the rules of Clark Catholicism, the first one I randomized on. Mm-hmm. This is a neighborhood in Kolkata. Ah, Kolkata. North Kolkata, which is in West Bengal. And Kolkata used to be called Calcutta. Mm. That's very interesting because I actually mentioned a book that I'm reading last episode Ah, called The Anarchy by William Dalrymple. And Calcutta was, I mean, actually, I can can read a little bit here. Uh, Calcutta was a, a bunch of villages that the East India Company took over and turned into sort of their ba- a base of operations. I think mm. it was Calcutta and Madras were the two kind of key places that they then fanned out from. And this is really incredible timing because, you know, I'm reading uh, here about after the fall of uh, Suraj Dula, who was the last independent Nawab of Bengal, defeated by the East India Company, which I was just reading about, purchased these villages in 1758 from Mir Jafar, who was a commander in the, in the military. Near, near Jafar. Mir, M-I-R, Jafar. Near Jafar, near wherever, wherever you, you are. are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Get out of my head, Charles. We haven't had one of those moments. We, we haven't had one of those moments in a while, but I love that. We have it, actually. Great. Well done. Well done. I'm giving you a little sort of, I'm giving you a sort of mental high five. Whoosh. We are of one mind. I mean, a cognitive high five, not one where I sort of like go to high five and then like do a backflip and jump off a cliff or something, you know, not that mental. <laughs> Whoa, that's a mental high five, dude. <laughs> that's so interesting. Yeah, incredible timing. Um... Uh, and basically, there's a, a section here that says the uh, uh, so Kosipal, it was originally the Kosipal Reach was one of the finest stretches of the river, River Ganges, I assume, and lined by a number of villa residences. And it sort of grew out from uh, the villages were purchased in 1758, right? So they I, presumably there were there was a long village history, but then it became part of this mega city of of now Kolkata. Which and this article is actually not terribly long, but I, I did click through onto Kolkata. Did you know how many people live in the city out of interest? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to tell me? No, no, no. Next question, please. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, as you well know, Dan. <laughs> do you know how many people live there? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's another thing that. <laughs> the, the thing is, the reason I ask is because my wife has a superpower. Pixel wife has mm. the uncanny ability to just guess numbers mm. and it's so frustrating because you you'd come across some crazy fact like guess how many octopi are of octopodes are found in pipes every year and she'd be like 500 and he'd be like yeah well yeah but now that you've said it it's not impressive yeah i mean crucially she doesn't have a she doesn't have like a gift of guessing numbers she guesses numbers correctly is the crucial point there otherwise it would be a yeah. pretty under underwhelming skill can you guess numbers? yeah that's true she just yeah, says 17. a number wow that's, that's amazing wow. that's our number <laughs> she would have, if i asked her this i could literally go downstairs and ask her this right now why not hang on i'm gonna pause pause the podcast i'm gonna go and ask her how many people she thinks lives in kolkata one eternity later so i just went downstairs and asked her Mm -hmm. she fired her brow Mm -hmm. and looked up and said 12 million okay in the metropolitan area of kolkata Mm -hmm. there are 14 million people wow see that is quite spooky isn't it how does she do it like Admittedly, that's losing two Birmingham's yes. within Kolkata. So there's, there's a bit of a, a margin for error. I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> no, nor would I. I absolutely wouldn't have. Wouldn't have. My guess would have been, yeah, I think probably quite a lot lower. Yeah, well, I mean, admittedly, in the metropolis, like in the core of the city, like, you know, Greater London, I suppose, is four and a half million. But the metro area is 14 million, which is, interestingly, the article notes, the th- Third, I think it said, the third most populous metropolitan area in India, hmm. which goes to show just how many people live in India. Yeah, my goodness. I was thinking, so you've been reading about India in this book that sounds great and I definitely want to read it. Hmm. But the fact that we've had this article and I think something happened when, readers, if you cast your mind back to last episode, we spoke about how we met up at um, Shares Wickham, mm. and we were talking about it, and there was something that came up that gave you cause to talk about the book. I'm wondering how many more instances this is going to occur, and when we can start blaming... What's that? Is it Bader-Meinhof phenomenon? Oh, I 
don't think I know. Do you know this? It's when you read something or hear about something that you think is obscure, and then for some inexplicable reason, it suddenly seems to appear everywhere. The Bader uh, Meinhof phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. Frequency illusion. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I suppose what I'm stumbling across here is that there's a lot of stuff to do with India because it turns out India really important country, mm. and the East India Company really big impact on modern geopolitics. Yeah. So yes, you are actually probably right. But yeah, the, that did come up at the party. I can't remember what it was. But yes, this is now a little bit spooky, but I suppose not too surprising. But yeah, anyway, still unusual. So Kosovo, I mean, I could tell you a couple of other things. I've actually read out a fair bit of the article already. It's not that long, considering that, uh, oh, for population C linked KMC war. Bit of page. Danny's dad there. Well done. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dan, it's your dad. Hey, Dan. Uh... <laughs> uh, uh, I did find, by the way, all those songs from the compilation are available on Spotify. Oh, phenomenal. So, <laughs> hang on, right. This district has a population of 53,000. It's two districts, basically. There's 53,000 plus... Okay, so there's about 100,000 people that live in this neighbourhood. So a, a, about the size of Bath-ish. Actually, what is the population of Bath? I think it's about 90,000. Well, we don't need to Google it. You just need to go and ask... Pixel life. Yeah, I should just go and ask Pixel life. I, okay, 94,000. So yeah, pretty much spot on. The city in which I live in is about the size of this neighbourhood, very small neighbourhood in, in Kolkata. Wow. I'd love to go to India. Mm. I would really, really love to go because it's, I, I suppose it's like somebody saying, I'd love to go to Europe because it's such a huge country and there's so much diversity. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it, to say I want to go to India it's yeah, such an enormous place and, and a variety of, you know, the minutiae of cultural differences across the, across the country must be huge. And it's also a place where well, basically going anywhere other than America, really, that was a, a British colony. Mm. You, I mean, there's a, there's a whole other layer of, I don't even know how to really put it into words. It's like, I'm coming here and there's a shared cultural heritage, which is awkward. Try song. There's a shared cultural heritage, but I don't know how I feel about it Because my ancestors were dickheads who enslaved your people And made a lunch of profit and caused famines and droughts And caused a lot of innocent people to die And the British Empire wasn't that great See, it just came so naturally Fergus, if you could put music under that, that would be fantastic <laughs> Fergus, if you can actually do that, I mean, we're not paying you enough <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I couldn't put it into words, but uh, there you go. That's the best I can do. Oh, we don't need Coral Piece of the Week now. <clears throat> yeah, I provided you with one. You've gotten away scot-free. <laughs> Why do we say scot-free? I don't know. Etymology of, of scot-free. Scot Was it a person called scot-free? Is it like Jeffrey? <laughs> or Joffrey, even? Oh, scot-free refers to being without tax. Ah. scot was an early Icelandic and Old Norse word for payment or tax. It came into Middle English as beskot, referring specifically to a customary tax paid to a lord, bailiff or sheriff, and into Old French as escot, or esco, I guess, and ultimately into Modern English as scot. Interesting. So scot-free just means exempt from tax. Ah, you learn every day's a school day. Yeah, wow. Amazing. This is uh, Damn, we're learning. Stop it. I don't like it. <laughs> this is very strange. Anyway, to draw back to a point, yeah, I'd like to go to India. I don't know how I would ever make it work considering my current, at least for the foreseeable future, I'm not going to be flying. And I know that you can take trains there, but it would take a very, very long time to get to India. But it's just such a, I don't know, from reading this book and from everything that I've learned elsewhere, it just, there's so much dynamism, you know? Like, it's, it's one of those parts of the world where there's just so much going on. And it's also quite an interesting time in Indian history right now. Like, this century is going to be India's century, where it really kind of comes back into its own on the world stage after centuries of being suppressed by the British Empire. Like, I don't know. It's just such a... There's something that calls me to it. It's like the sea in Moana, but it's me and India. And it might be the food. I literally just have Indian food for dinner. Maybe this is actually where all this is coming from. <laughs> now I think about it, yes, it probably is my stomach that's leading me there. But as you say... We have had a choral piece this week, but would you like, Dan, to recommend another choral piece of the week? Well, I, th I thought we might actually do something different. What? Because I haven't been doing a great deal of singing, because I now, I've, I'm, I'm busy working for the man, you know? I'm on that little hamster wheel, mm. just, you know, 
charging away. I thought maybe might make a return to poetry. No. Oh my goodness me. Maybe. Maybe. Poetry corner. When I say maybe, I mean that's what we're going to do. That, that's, what, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what I've prepared. So we're doing that. Do my eyes deceive me? Well, what, what are we going to be treated to? And which delectation and or delight? Well, let's jump right in. I'll leave a pause there so we can put like the poetry yeah, that's jingle great. in. Make, yeah, make cool. sure you keep this bit in, Fergus. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Poetry Corner. Po- po- poetry Corner. Poetry, poetry, poetry Corner. Right. So returning to poetry, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because, much to my delight, a podcast I listen to that I absolutely adore called the Frank Skinner Poetry Podcast, hosted by the comedian Frank Skinner, did an episode recently on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I didn't know a great deal about Elizabeth. I've heard the name. Yeah. So she was married to Robert Browning, who is a similarly sort of famous poet in his own right. Very sort of well known for dramatic monologue and things. I must admit, I didn't really know much about Elizabeth, but she's fascinating and brilliant. And I thought we might just might just have one of hers. So in the podcast episode that Frank hosted talking about Elizabeth Barrett Browning, EBB, he touched on a poem or discussed a poem called Mother and Poet, which is amazing, but it's like 20 or 50 stanzas long. So I'm not going to do that one. Um, but Thank I would you. recommend everybody to listen, give this podcast a listen, at uh, that podcast, well, obviously this one, a listen. But Frank's one is great too, and you should absolutely have a look. But she's also written a selection of sonnets, and I thought maybe a sonnet would be nice because it's quite, you know, it's quite compact, short. A sonnet also key to, I, I can't remember if you've, you, have you seen Oppenheimer yet? No. Oh, okay. A sonnet is key to Oppenheimer as well. Not actually so much the film, but it's, it is referenced. But there's a link. I'm trying to make tenuous links here, Dan. I'm trying to connect it to other parts of the podcast because it's such a, it's, it's like bringing an old character back from an old film series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to reestablish the law. Well, I'm actually, I, I was going to say something more about this, but I'm going to just read it because I want to know whether you've heard it before. I wouldn't be surprised if you have, because this is one of her more well-known ones. Okay. This is Sonnet 43, and it's titled, How Do I Love Thee? How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight. For the ends of being and ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose, with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. I don't think I have heard that one. I really like it. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. It's quite a common quotation of hers. Yeah, I love thee with a love I seemed to lose. With my lost saints, I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. I don't know, I'm on a bit of a binge. It was, incidentally, one of my favourite episodes of the Frank Skinner podcast, talking about John Clare, the peasant poet. I, 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 there was definitely an episode of the podcast. This is a long time ago, we're going really back into the archives. I, was, I remember you would mentioning this guy. But yeah. I'm obsessed. I mean, John Clare, phenomenal. But yeah, I'm on a bit of a, an EBB binge. And I encourage everybody to give her a read. So that's Elizabeth Barrett Browning. How do I love thee? Ah, well, let us know what you think about Poetry Corner in correspondence and uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, Dan will see what he can do. Now, I mentioned earlier, Dan, that uh, there was a pin that I put in a, a conversation. I wanted to return to it. Ah, yes. Because I've well, actually, there's a few things I've been watching recently. Maybe maybe we'll talk about one of those other things, which has been The Witcher season three. Oh yes, which I've been watching with Pixel Wife. However, something which I've devoured in the past two days, mm-hmm. which is a very appropriate choice of verb, is two excellent videos from a channel called Eddie Burback. This is a guy who, first of all, went on a road trip for 21 days to eat at every rainforest cafe in america mm-hmm. uh, do, do you know what a rainforest cafe is i think i've i've certainly heard of it in various 
sort of pop culture things. Um, I don't really know what it is, though. So it's like a chain restaurant, which is themed around rainforests. And in each location, there are like animatronic gorillas and elephants. And there's a, a thunderstorm that goes off every 20 minutes. Wait, animatronic elephants or real elephants? Animatronic elephants. Okay, just checking. And, just checking. you know, the whole thing is like, you know, the menu's themed and stuff like that. And it's the kind of thing where you might take your kids, maybe. Okay. You know, it's like, a, we'll go to the we'll go to the mall and we'll go we'll go to Rainforest Cafe. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, this guy went to every single one in America and Canada okay. and filmed it. And it's like filming his descent into madness. And it was so good. And there's a sequel where he goes to every Margaritaville which is uh, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville, which is a series of restaurants and casinos and holiday resorts that are all like Florida Key West and chill on the beach kind of thing. Oh, right. And, and that one, he goes for a hell of an arc of learning to love Jimmy Buffett and then like, you know, embodying the chill vibe and hating everything and then kind of coming back out. Amazing videos. I'll link to both of them in the description. Would highly recommend. What I was wondering is... In both of these videos, he goes on a road trip with a friend of his, mm -hmm. and it's like a it's a buddy road trip. Mm -hmm. But they have the restaurant thing over the course of several weeks to keep them going. What if we were to do a road trip? I think I would prefer it if it was somehow food and drink based. Oh, 100%. It would have to be food and drink. Well, okay, so an obvious one, although I can already see the, the sort of major flaw in this. Major flaw. We're both whiskey fans, right? I knew that you would say this, but mm. yes, go on. Yeah, so why don't we do a whiskey road trip, and how do we drive? <laughs> right, okay. Scotland has 140 malt and grain distilleries. Okay, okay. So what you're proposing that we go to every single... We have a dram at each and every one. Over the course of 48 hours, yeah. It'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's better, to be fair. 143, I do beg your pardon. That is better than my original thought. We could call ahead... We could call ahead to these distilleries oh, and yeah. say that we're right, we're like coming for a tasting and making a video, and they can come and host us. But what they don't realise is that we can only spend like a maximum of five seconds there. So they'll be outside <laughs> waiting to greet us, and then they'll just hear sort of like, "Thank you, mate." <laughs> yeah, <the> screeching <laughs> of car tyres. Where's the scotch? <laughs> but this is better than my original idea, which was, "What if we went to every Weatherspoons in the country?" Oh, there's no way. There's no way we could do that. Do you want to guess how many Weatherspoons there are in the country? Oh, probably like 250. Now, this was one that Pixel Wife did get wrong. Oh, really? <laughs> because I asked her this question this morning, because this is when I had this idea. There are 826 what? in the UK. Oh, that's just crazy. That makes me sad. That makes me really I sad. I know. I mean, just to be clear, everyone at home, if you don't know what Weatherspoons is, it's a, it's a pub chain. They're, they're really quite bad pubs most of the time. Yeah, run by a despicable man. Yeah, very uh, pro-Brexit, quite right-wing. It's a, it's like kind of a lowest common denominator pub where it's like, fine, you're probably not going to get stabbed in most of them. But like, you know, it's okay. But the, the, there were several in Exeter. We have some very fond memories of going to ones in Exeter, which funnily enough actually does contain Tim Martin, the owner of Weatherspoons, local. Mm. He used to go to the George's Meeting House. So yeah, th th I'm not, we're not, this is not an endorsement of Weatherspoons. However, there are, I think, 20 in London. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. Which is suddenly... Oh, actually, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. I have just gone on the page for London and apparently there's more than 20. Okay. How many are there? Like 120? There are over 100 in Greater London. Right. Okay. Why don't we do every pub along a major tube line or just train line? Well, hang on. How many pubs are there in Exeter? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Uh, pubs and bars, pubs and extra, pubs and extra. Here we go. Pubsgalore.co.uk. 18, 22, something like that. Oh my God. There's so, there's no way these are all in extra. Surely. The thing is, where do you draw the line, right? Are they all as in like walking distance from the city center? Because they might be counting like pubs in Topsham or, you know. This one's in Salton, Bridford, Topsham. Yeah. Okay. So they're not all in extra. Exeter pubs and public houses. Because that's more achievable. If we went and had a drink in every pub in Exeter. That is an mm. idea. That's an idea. Okay. Or is, is there a chain of, of like, uh, uh, you know, similar to Margaritaville or whatever? Is there a chain of, of, of places that we could eat? 
where there's not that many of them. Because mm. the other idea I had was if it wasn't food and drink related is if we went to every cathedral in the UK. <laughs> That's, I think something of a less interesting video is I, we went to Evensong at every cathedral in the UK. Well, you know what you could do? And on the glorious page that is in choirs and places where they meme, mm. they were trying to put together a document that listed every sort of back row hangout pub near every cathedral in the uk Ah. so for like visiting choirs and things they'd know where to go for a good pint Mm. so what we could do is select i mean it might be a challenge to try and do all that well maybe we could every cathedral pub that could be quite fun well hang on church of england cathedrals because otherwise we will just develop alcohol poisoning yes the Anglican cathedrals are there. You should know this. I should know this, seeing as I work for the Cathedral Music Trust. There are 42, apparently. Okay, that's doable. If we did it as a series... Oh, no, that, you'd road trip it. Yeah. Like, I'd do that as because these videos are like 50 minutes long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's not we went to every cathedral, it's went to, we, we went to every cathedral choir pub. Yes. <laughs> the most... And and met up with a representative from each. Oh my god! <laughs> Turn it into like an ambassadorial thing. Oh, it's like we're, we're gathering the tribes. I'm not okay. This is now becoming alarmingly large. I don't know if this is possible. Well, th- look, the idea of a road trip of sorts is something I'm very keen to do. I think something in the short term might be more doable, like you know, doing something along a tube route. Or, or a, like a train route or something in London, right? Because we could do that in a day. Yeah, what, I mean, what if you did... It's weird how we both gravitated towards pubs. Is it weird? <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure it's weird. Yeah, let me put it like that. <laughs> um, what, what, what if, what if we, t- we picked a tube line and we drank at a, a pub closest to each station on the line? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that would work. London Underground. What is this? I, I just, hang on, I literally just Googled it and the information has fallen out of my head. The shortest tube line is Waterloo and City. Okay. So how many stops are there on the Waterloo and City line? I'm on the Jubilee line most of the time, so I'm afraid I don't know. This is thrilling listening, I'm sure. <laughs> if you listen closely, readers, you can hear both of our brains just The fans are kicking in, like when a computer clunking, over, over Clunking away as the cogs slowly turn. <laughs> stations I, I, I basically i saw these videos and i just was like yeah i, I want to do something like this i haven't done something stupid in a while oh do you know how many stations there are on the waterloo and city line how many two. <laughs> oh, okay maybe maybe a different line i feel like the uh, i feel like that might be um a little bit too easy some would say what are the stops waterloo and what city presumably <laughs> i didn't think there was a stop called city it must be somewhere in, in the city, like, I don't know, Farringdon or something. Or Hang on, Waterloo and City Line. Of Waterloo and City Line stations, there are two, and those stations are... Oh, my God, why is this article so big on Wikipedia? Holy crap. Oh, it goes between Bank and Waterloo. Uh, of course, Bank. Yeah. I've been on this line, now I think about it. I've certainly been to Waterloo and Bank. I don't know whether... I... Oh, hang on. Yes, I have. It's that comically short one. I remember the signs now. Yeah. Yes. What if we did the Lizzie line? I mean, that would be a treat. Trouble is, we'd start in Reading. Oh, God. And end, oh, up, at like, no. end up at like Heathrow. Oh. It's a huge line, and there's so many stops. I mean, that sounds like something that we should do as a challenge, though. Yeah. I mean, I'd be up for it. Hang on, how many stations? Elizabeth line stations. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't it have to be an alcoholic drink at each station, I suppose. I think if it's Elizabeth Line, it's probably quite important that it's not an alcoholic drink. Yeah. We'll be dead by Tottenham Court Road. <laughs> Hang on. St- stop. There are 41 stops. You wouldn't do all of them, though, because there's like the different... Branches. Splinter bits of it. Yeah. B- branches, that's the word I'm looking for. Why don't we do Bakerloo Line? One of us dresses as Holmes. The other dresses as Watson. <laughs> <laughs> and we do and we do but we, we try and do like old pubs on that line okay there are 25 oh that's doable especially if you had halves at each one <laughs> still quite a lot but like, <laughs> yeah but it'll be spread over quite a long time it's still quite a lot so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, I'm that's sure. a defeatist attitude right there dad <laughs> yeah i think this has got legs okay so if if you would like to see because I think we probably would do this as a video rather than a podcast. It would make a pretty terrible podcast. Yeah. It would just be a lot of slurping and walking. We'd probably have to have someone with us to act as camera person. Yes. Yeah, that's true. So if you would like to see us and a camera person try to go to every pub 
<laughs> on the Bakerloo line. The nearest pub to every stop on the Bakerloo line. Yeah. Uh, you know, responses on a postcard. <laughs> yeah, let us know, because all it would take is a single poke for me to do this, I think. As long as nothing comes up in like the immediate future where I'm like, well... If I somehow come up with a new project in the next couple of months, this is something I'm genuinely very interested in doing. It'll be very fun, that's for sure. Okay. Mm, that's an idea. Well, okay, let's part that for now. There we go. We've developed this idea to its logical conclusion, which is go get pissed on the Bakerloo line. Yeah. Have you been reading or watching anything down that you'd like to critique in Critics Corner? Let me think. There was some... Oh, that's right. I, as you know, I'm staying with celebrity of the podcast, Hugo Wickman. Hugo Wickman, indeed. With him in in, uh, in London. And last night, the flat watched The Exorcist. I've no- That's weird. I was thinking about The Exorcist just the other day, because mm. I've, I've still never seen it. In honour of William Friedkin's death. Of course, the director died. Yes, yes um, died yesterday. So we watched The Exorcist last night, and it was hilarious. I don't think that was the intended. No, precisely. But that's why it's so good, because, I mean, there are still moments of it, I suppose, that could be something close to creepy but it's so dated now that all i felt from it was just sort of it, i just thought it was very funny to watch it's a brilliant film i'm not i'm not disputing the, the sort of brilliance of the film um, by any stretch but i did just find it quite funny although i think are they not doing a remake i mean probably chances are if it's an old beloved franchise they're probably remaking it yeah the exorcist believer right it's coming to cinemas this year we should go I can barely contain my excitement. <laughs> we should go. Let's go. I have negative interest in seeing horror films, I will I will say. Really? I quite like them. I just they don't appeal. I like the rush. I, in the same way that I don't like getting voluntarily stabbed. I don't know. I think there's something Mark Kermode said about horror films and thrillers and things making you feel alive when you watch them, you know, because of the adrenaline and the sort of that scare factor. And I I absolutely get that. I did actually when I was on tour uh with the University of Exeter Chapel Choir in Bavaria. We had a sort of afternoon off and I watched The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, which was the sort of most recent oh, film. From the yeah, co- yeah. It is awful. It is so <laughs> bad. So bad. I can't say I'm surprised. No, and, I, and, you know, and it's a shame because I thought the first one was actually quite good and quite genuinely scary. But yeah, I mean, just just awful. But are, they, are these modern horror films, having not seen any of them, from what I can tell... They are, it's an idea that you can use once, maybe, but it's not enough to carry a franchise. I think any sort of franchise horror is going about it the wrong way. For instance, I don't know if you've seen Hereditary, the A24. No. Now that is properly scary. Right. Really, really creeped me out. Yeah, really eerie, really uncomfortable, genuinely terrifying film. I just, I, I just, I'm not going to see him. I just, yeah. <laughs> I don't like feeling that way, Dan. Yeah, fair if enough. I, if I want to feel scared, I'll just look at my student loan repayments. What, your graduate tax? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. I get that you sort of have to be a, a certain kind of person enjoys watching it, right? I don't know, I like it. But having said that, I don't think I liked watching Hereditary because it was just so proper... It makes your skin crawl. It really makes you feel really uncomfortable. That doesn't sound great. You're, you're doing the opposite of selling it to me. <laughs> but that's amazing because that's what it's meant to do. It, it's fulfilling its purpose. It's very clever. It's very cleverly shot and the, the writing is really interesting and it properly freaks you out because it's convincing. You know, if ridiculous, well, not ridiculous, but obviously, you know, the, any, anything that really successfully allows you to suspend your disbelief. Yeah. Amazing. Very clever. It's just not for me. I just that's I, okay. If you want right. if, if people want to email in and try and convince me, be my guest. But yeah, I, but but okay. But you watched the Exorcist and you found it funny. Yeah, I think it, was, it was nice to watch. I hadn't seen it in a long time, and I'm glad that we all watched it. It was jolly. Well, something else I have watched, which I'm Pixel Life is loving, mm-hmm. but does see its flaws, and I'm muddling through. Is, is as I said, The Witcher season three, which. I really liked season one. I thought season one of The Witcher was fantastic. Season two, I was a bit like, oh, this is not that great anymore. And I think the writing's just gone completely off the wall in season three. It's mm, Yeah, I've heard this. It's very difficult to follow what's going on. And, and this is some... I, I don't think I'm a stupid person. I, I was into the first two seasons and we watched the recap before season three. I still don't know 
when people are using names, I don't know who they're referring to. The show doesn't do something like... I think Game of Thrones had a similar problem in that there were so many people and there was so much politics and you had to be reminded all the time of who everyone was. But they did take the time to remind you. Mm. And everything was geographically based. You knew where you were. I just don't feel that way with this. I feel like the the writing is just not up to scratch for how vast a story they're trying to tell. Yeah, sure. And it's just a bit disappointing because this is the final season that Henry Cavill is playing Geralt. Before he signs on to the enormous Warhammer thing, right? Well, I am not sure the enormous Warhammer thing is going to happen. I would love it if they did, as long as they do it in a clever way. What, like Claymation? No, as in... Wallace and Gromis. (laughs) Gromis. <laughs> Wallace and Gromit meets Warhammer 40,000. Meets, meets Space Marines. I think the problem is if they pick a Space Marine based stories, a story even, they're setting themselves up to fail. Yeah. Like, and the problem is that they're such an iconic part of Warhammer that that's naturally, I think, what the the executives would be like. We want this. We want the thing that everybody recognises as the toys. Well, the image sells, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, Space Marines are child soldiers that have been brainwashed and pumped full of hormones and grossly misproportioned and are not very interesting protagonists. It's much more interesting to base a story in Warhammer around the average person who's living in the most nightmarish world and galaxy imaginable Mm. and just tries to survive. That's a much more compelling story, and I'm worried that they're going to just go for big space marines, fight each other, clang, clang, clang. Sure. And it's unlikely that it'll ever be made because I think it's in development, is the phrase they're using at the moment, which is basically code for we're thinking about it. And we're going to put some money towards it and maybe we'll make it, maybe we won't. And I think, I don't know what the statistics are, but I'm pretty sure the majority of shows that go into development don't actually get made. It's a bit of a misnomer. So I I don't know if he's going to be going on to to do the Warhammer thing. I think that's probably what he's hoping is going to happen, but I don't know if it'll come to pass. Yeah. I'm not getting my hopes up, but sure. you know, it's just, it's just a shame because when he when he's been playing Geralt, I know it's not to everyone's taste, but I really like him. I think he's he carries the character very well. I think he manages the physicality and the philosophical side nicely, and it's just a a shame to see him go because he was once so super passionate about the role, and apparently, from what I've heard the executive producers mm. had a falling out with him about the direction of the show, and that's just a bit sad to see, really. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And if there was some good TV at the end, maybe I wouldn't mind so much. But uh, I don't think there is. Again, people will be very welcome to, to write in with your reviews of The Witcher, but I, I don't think season three is very good. I think I'm only like midway through the third season, and I would concur at this point with your thoughts. Top lad. And what's that sound? It's that time again that tells us that we're in the loveliest of corners. Simon, it's Patreon Corner. It's Patreon Corner, where we celebrate patreon.com forward slash the wikicast. And all of the wonderful people who support us and make this podcast possible. Without your support, you wouldn't be listening to this sort of dirge right now. (laughs) You pay for our hosting, you pay for our editor, you pay for the future video that is going to be Simon and I getting pissed on the Bakerloo line. I mean, you know, what more is there to love? What more could you want from us? (laughs) So, so much more. Yeah, actually, yeah, don't answer that. There are many ways of supporting us. Uh, you can, for, for a dollar a month, you can choose to be on Team Cat or Team Dog, or for five dollars a month, you can become a Top Cat or a Top Dog. And I would like to say an enormous thank you to those who support at Top Dog tier. So, massive kudos and thank you to Jay Wright, Ben McMurtry, Peter Reed, Codzo, Colin J. Brown, Lexi at Front Desk, Hasse Hansen, Henry VII, King of England and of France, Lord of Ireland, Aaron Jorgensen, Nafla Rock, Andrian with an N, Chan, Ben Caples, Nartin Narciso, Christian from the Alps, Lexi at Front Desk's boss, Amy Bonney, Sophie, Carnav, and Dan Nelson. Thank you so much. Whereas I would like to thank the people who very sensibly supported at Top Cat Tier, which would be. Lord Lewis Bassingdale of Annettsford and its surrounding provinces. Isabella, Lexi at Front Desk's arch enemy, James S. and Arifa, Nathan Flaherty, The Kyrian on Caffeine, Simon P., Jack Easton, Izzy CC, Nafi Iftikar, Christopher Betterton, Dame Valerie III, Layla Medina, Will Jonas Humphreys, Rents Kirk, Oliver Burkhart, Carl Mansfield, and the one and only Dan Hanvey. Thank you so much. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to make the show, and frankly, that means it's all your fault. Anyway, next let's go on to a bumper edition of Corrine's Pondent's Corner. Top lad! 
He went so West Country there. Correspondence Corner. No, Bumper. Bumper. <laughs> you were, and then midway through reading out the names, you went very sort of, you sounded like on some of the tube lines, the person who does the announce, mind the gap. You went, re- you went really, really <laughs> sort, of, sort of, I don't know how to describe it. It was amazing. It was very good. It was very professional. Mind the gap. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. And those bumpers, mind. <laughs> mind those bumpers, Everyone's bumping mind. around here. Farmers. <laughs> like, Farmers' mums. Like who? They saw me bumping on the sofa. It weren't me. <laughs> it weren't me. <laughs> weren't I. <laughs> Even caught me on camera. It weren't I. <laughs> She caught me red-handed, banging with the girl next door. <laughs> we were both but naked, banging on the bathroom floor. <laughs> How could I have forgotten i given her an extra key? <laughs> All that time she was standing there. <laughs> to me. never take her eyes off me. Goodness me. Oh, my God. This is where I need to remember the, the rapping bit. <laughs> How can you give your woman access to your villa? Trespass on a witness while you cling to your pillar. You better watch your back before she turn into a killer. Let's review the situation that you caught you up in. Too true to be a play. You have to know how to play. Beautiful. <laughs> if she stay a night, convince her to stay a day. Never admit to a word when she's saying. If she claim how you tell her, baby, no way. See, this is basically your poetry corner. Yeah, that's what that is. It's come, it's, come full, it's, it's come full circle. And we find ourselves in Correspondence Corner, where we asked last episode for people to send in their reviews, didn't we, Dan? Yes. Yes, we did. Of both Barbie and Oppenheimer, and we've had several people who seem to have watched both films. But before we go on to that, I do have a missive here from the Swedish Wikicast. Oh, yes, I think I saw this earlier. So apparently my memory is faulty, which has obviously never happened before. I've never made a mistake in my life. Where she, Isabel has written, Correction correspondence, baked beans. How dare you slander us by giving the readership the impression that we don't like baked beans? <laughs> It may be a bit bland and sweet, rude, accurate, but it is a great snack or a quick meal on toast or a baked potato or just one single cold bean at a time straight from the can if you're a specific member of the Swedish Wikicast. Wow, I love that. And I hate baked beans, oh. but I love that. <laughs> no. Oh, how? C- OK, there's only there's only a few people that could be, Dan. Mm. Oh no, I didn't I didn't want to know that. That's terrible. I think we might need to rethink the Swedish franchise, you know. I don't know. I think it's I think it's marvelous. Anyway, you truly must be misremembering parts of your Stockholm trip. Beans, Isabel. P.S. We can critique the fact that the British colonial settlers just grabbed a Native American dish and associated it with themselves, but I digress. Yeah, very true, Isabel, very true. I refer you to my song about the British Empire earlier this very episode. <laughs> But okay, I apologise for having faulty memory. I, uh, I I stand corrected. And uh, the Swedish Wiki cast loves baked beans. But, and one of them, only one bean at a time. Cold. Straight from the can. Straight from the can. <laughs> That's, I like to imagine that they use chopsticks. I don't know why. A single baked bean at a time. Also, the, that, re- that review coming out expli- inexplicably as Duke Nukem. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. God, it took me a moment to process what you were saying <laughs> Straight from the can. Straight from the can. Cold, like my enemies after I'm finished with them. <laughs> we have an email here from Will, Simon. Oh, yes. Will writes, uh, there's, the subject is Biennial Update, Barbenheimer Opinions <gasps> and Arcade Games. It's the Dark Matter guy! <laughs> Will writes, hello Simon and Dan. Edinburgh Dark Matter talk guy here for the first time since graduating with a master's in physics. Bravo. Hey! Excellent work. Love your work. And now a high school physics teacher in East Manchester. Oh! How lovely. Well done. I wanted to share my Barbenheimer opinions having done the double bill with a bunch of also physicist mates. Aha! Okay. We watched Oppenheimer first in order to not end the day terminally depressed, <laughs> yep. with a break in between for pints and a few costume changes, black shirts to pink shirts. Very good, very, very good. Very fine. Oppenheimer was sublime and to me felt much shorter than the three-hour runtime. I, for one, love the committee scenes, although I'm a sucker for a courtroom drama and that sort of thing, and seeing it in IMAX with the true 70 millimeter film really enhanced the feel of those black and white shot oh, scenes. Yeah, I wish I could have seen it in mm. IMAX. I really do. 
Only gripe was that it felt a bit like physicist bingo and Einstein popping up at the like the ghost of Christmas past and were just slightly jarring. Four and a half stars for Oppie from me. Okay, right. Will goes on to say Barbie was also absolutely excellent. A really fun experience, chock full of in-jokes and an excellent soundtrack as well. I agree with Dan that the pacing was slightly strange, but I'm willing to deal with that for the incredible aesthetic of the whole thing. Four stars. Okay, so they've, they've preferred Oppenheimer. Mm. Interesting. As for arcade games, I can't have been the only kid who, lacking money to play the driving game or House of the Dead at the local cinema, just pretended I was playing. Just pretended I was playing, turning the wheel and pressing the pedals while the demo screen was on. Tell me I wasn't the only oh, weirdo yeah. doing this age 10. Will, you absolutely weren't. I, I was 100% doing that. I'm, I'm right there with you. I would have done that as well myself, yes. God, that's, a, that's like a core memory being unlocked and <laughs> inside out. Wow. Hope you're both doing very well and best wishes for the coming months. Will, aged two times e to the power of 20 seconds. Yes, e, the irrational number. It's a non-standard unit, but will sustained. <laughs> but it checks out. We have another Barbenheimer review here uh, with the subtitle An Inevitable Dystopian Society from Connor Levers. Mm. Dear Wikicast, while I didn't see Barbie and Oppenheimer back to back, I did watch them within the space of a week of each other. I enjoyed both films. I knew I would enjoy Oppenheimer, but was pleasantly surprised to enjoy Barbie even more than expected. I would happily see both again. I knew going into Barbie there was going to be some punches at men and ripping into toxic masculinity, etc. So I was ready for some jokes aimed our way, and I did have a laugh. I absolutely loved when Ken became a stereotypical douchey man. However, I honestly thought the movie was going to end differently. I thought the Barbies and Kens parentheses, and Alan, would all come to the agreement that neither Barbies or Kens should exclusively rule Barbie land, and instead they would cooperate after changing the constitution to include all citizens. Instead, the Barbies removed all the Kens from power and refused to let them have any representation on the Supreme Court until a later, to be confirmed time. I can understand the point they're making if there had never been any women on the Supreme US Supreme Court to mirror reality, but there have been several women on the Supreme Court, although do appreciate it's very heavily weighted towards men. I just thought the movie shows Barbie land going from dystopia, where Kens are subservient to Barbies to another where the Barbies are subservient to Ken's and then back again. What do you think of that, Dan? Yeah, I take the point. I do. There were lots of moments where I think the film could have tried to make a bigger point by more closely mirroring our society now. Mm. I wonder whether that would have been just too handholdy, sort of ham-fisted. You know what I mean? Yeah. The dystopian message fits because that's the world you're in. Yeah, I think that what they were doing was, I think I said this in the podcast, like, if you flip the genders, it's like, you know, the state of feminism in like the 60s, right? It's like, the world is still very much run by men in the 60s. But it's like, okay, yeah, sure. Well, you know, this is this is your chance to, to prove yourself women, see what you do with this. That was the vibe I got, but with the, the genders flip, like, yeah, the, the Barbie court will still be all female, but you know, we'll give you a posting in a a lower court kind of thing. Mm. Like I felt Mm. like it was realistically dystopian, I suppose. And like, I think it would have been too saccharine if they had done it. It would have been too Disney-like. Yeah. Had they flipped it, you know, made it, you know, completely, complete equality. And much as that, you know, would go with it being a kid's film, I suppose you could argue that this is a film that is trying to represent a very complex topic. And there aren't fairy tale endings in real life. You know, perhaps this is a simplistic take, but mm. you are you're trying to set young girls up to be like, hey, you know, the solution isn't perfect, but we've got to roll with the way the world is, not the way that we want the world to be in an idealized case. Yeah. And I suppose like case in point, you know, they, they could have had a very syrupy, sickly sweet ending, mm. but that's very much not what they do. I mean, do you remember what happens at the very end of the film? Yes, I do. I don't want to say it because yeah. you can't really talk about it without being a spoiler. No, well, exa- of course, but that's my point. You know, those who have seen it know that, you know, it's not all sort of happy clappy, is it? It's, it's real. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, real, precisely. And they, uh, Connor goes on to say, regarding Oppenheimer, I wish they spent a bit more time actually showing the absolute destruction of an atomic slash hydrogen bomb. We only see it implied from Oppenheimer's PTSD episodes and that one hallucination of a burnt corpse. I did like that the only explosion shown was from the Trinity test rather than the bombing of the cities themselves, though. I completely agree with that. I completely back Connor's take there. Mm-hmm. Right call not to show the bombing of the cities, but I do think they should have... I do wonder if maybe they wanted to show a bit more of the devastation but it would have meant going up a classification tier yeah it, it may have been a commercial decision of oh well because is it a 12a or is it 15 i think it might be a 12a but really i thought it would have been a 15 but I, th- I think if it had gone up to certainly if it had been an 18 i think it would have struggled to make 
as much money. I'm just going to double check, actually. What was the rating? Oh, no, it has an R rating huh. in America. So it must be a 15 here. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So it isn't that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish they had lent into that a bit more as well, then. O'Connor says, finally, not going to lie, I did have to read the synopsis of the film afterwards to truly understand what was going on with the congressional confirmation meeting slash deposition. I thought these things were dragged out a little too much. Yeah, I think I kind of agree with that, to be honest. I think it could have been made a bit clearer. Thanks, Connor. Age 123,331.579 Barbie runtimes. Amazing. P.S. Not entirely sure what Alan slash Michael Cera was meant to represent, but I do wish he got absolutely shredded for the role. I'm talking washboard abs. <laughs> Not for sex appeal, but just because the thought of seeing Scott Pilgrim slash Paulie from Juno slash Evan from Superbad absolutely chiseled would be an amazing sight. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I agreed. Abs- yeah, totally agree. And we have another Barbenheimer review here from, would you believe it, Alan, Simon. Alan. There's only one of Alan. Dear podcast writers, long-time listener, nth-time writer, footnote one. If you know, you know. <laughs> I was listening yes, we to do. The, I was listening to the latest pod when I felt a deep guttural call from the other side of the sea asking for some correspondence, so here's my letter. First of all, I don't recall any arcade games. I might have played once or twice, but it was not something you, uh, usual around my time and country. I wonder if it might be more of an English slash American cultural thing. I do remember, however, playing some Nintendo DS and Wii games. I had a Nintendo DS. I loved my Nintendo DS. I had Nintendogs. That was my first DS game. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. It's great. I mean, it's a terrible game, but uh, the memories are... Uh, <laughs> Nice. A fond. Second, Barbenheimer. I was one of the many who double-dipped and went with the double feature with a one-hour break in between, and what an experience. The contrast between both movies made it even better, and ending with Barbie in a higher, more positive note was the right choice for us. Sadly, Definitely. I didn't have any pink attire for the occasion. Ah, oh, sad. But both movies were so good. Oppenheimer felt like a serious, high-profile, masterful, Oscar-contending movie, although I've seen some criticism online about its female representation. Didn't feel like three hours at all, at least for me. Female represent. I hadn't considered it from that angle. I mean, you're limited by the people who are involved in the project, right? They could have made more, I suppose, of the role of women in, in the Manhattan Project. Mm-hmm. But yeah, when you're dealing with the representation of real people, I suppose they reduced his first partner to basically a Soviet sex object, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so I can see where that criticism comes from. Alan goes on to say, and Barbie was such a blast. I loved every single detail, prop, song, and gag. <laughs> I can't, re- can't remember laughing so much. <laughs> Over the course of this podcast, he's developed a really low gag reflex. <laughs> can barely brush my teeth. Just reading the word gag. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I loved. I'm just I... going to pop a mint in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I loved every single detail, prop, song, and <laughs> I can't remember laughing so much and having such an enjoyable time with a movie. Loved it. Greta Gerwig might be one of the best female directors, and I do agree with both of you on Alan. I didn't really understand what he stood for or his arc. However, his just me chilling energy made him the character I related to the most. Yeah. Third, sorry for the long email. Hope you have a great time and keep up the great non-tent Alan aged 0.2525 Duchess Catherines. I really am enjoying the <laughs> the various units of time in this. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. And we have one last email here about Barbenheimer. Uh, this is from Brummagem Michael. Oh, um, <laughs> but I'm Michael. And this is uh, titled, I Am Become Deaf, Destroyer of My Ears. Very good, very good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and people cooler than that, of the jury, hiya. I'm not afraid to say it, I barbenheimed myself in the cinema <laughs> last week. It's not something I was expecting to do, it's certainly not something I'm proud of, but my God, did it make me feel some very complicated feelings. I did Oppenheimer first, and I don't really have anything to add to the opinion of your good self, Simon. The sound d- design was wacky as sh- Far too loud in parts and incredibly difficult to hear in others. I also agree that there was a touch too much guff around the Senate trials and, a wee bit spoilery, I think the JFK name drop is a good example. That was like, somebody put it online as like, um, I don't think that's a spoiler, that when they drop JFK's name, it's like Nick Fury mentioning another superhero, like mm. they're going to set up the 1950s and 60s cinematic universe, yeah. which is just, which is perfect. I don't know whether Nolan expected us to gasp and Wojak point, but the, and they've included a, a picture of the Wojak point in the middle of the email, but the payoff for like an hour of a random side character being, oh yeah, Oppie got a medal off JFK, but that doesn't make him feel less guilty, felt slightly unnecessary. I don't think that's a spoiler. This is historical yeah, yeah, figures. Yeah. Overall, I did really enjoy it, but the immediate reaction out of the cinema was that of minor frustration at the length of the film and a kind of... <laughs> sound ringing in my ears. 
Then I got sloshed. Bumpsy. I was glowing. I was merry. I was ready for Barbie. I have a lot more feelings on Barbie, but I want to start off by saying genuinely great film, 9 out of 10. I really enjoyed the humour of it, especially in the first act. It was dumb fun without being lowbrow, and Robbie, Gosling, and Sarah were brilliantly cast, along with a lot of the other Barbies. Mm-hmm. Completely agree. The excellent, I didn't think we mentioned it, but excellent casting. Yeah. The cold open to Also Sprach really caught me by surprise and got me bad. I was caught in a giggle loop and so thoroughly enjoyed the majority of the film. I didn't really get the ending, but went back home via the pub, obviously, and didn't think much more of it. I ended up seeing it again two days later, finally sober, and I still stand by what I thought the first time. (laughs) The film earnestly criticised society, sexism and patriarchy in a brilliant way, and any social commentary was punctuated with a punchline that kept me engaged without taking away from the message. This was the major strength of the movie. But at the end, when they, also slightly spoilery, dropped everything for a three to four minute character scene with a sad Billie Eilish song in the background, it felt unearned and expected me to take this character way more seriously than at any other point in the film. Mm, I don't know if I agree with that. From what I remember, I've only seen it once. I I can I yeah I, I see I see what I see where Bromage and Michael's coming from actually. I think the choice of that particular soundtrack and the way that sequence was shot was a bit cheap. Yeah, well, yeah okay, but not entirely sort of unprepared. But Gerwig knew what she was doing, right? Yeah. There were other points when Barbie as a character started to become more emotional, but they were all played for laughs. So I sat waiting for a punchline, which never came. I saw others cry and have heard online talk about the emotion, but I just didn't get it. The film left me with messages of true feminism and existentialism, but I can't say it left me emotional in a way that a lot of other movies do. Did I miss something? Maybe. God knows at this point. If they wanted a truly emotional scene, they could have resolved the mum and daughter subplot fully or got rid of Will Ferrell from immediately before the big scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not mm-hmm. going to disagree with that. Yep. Basically... Oppenheimer, 7 out of 10. Nuclear bombs, bad. Barbie, 9 out of 10. Masterpiece. Minus one for me being too neurodivergent to understand it. <laughs> Yours truly, madly, deeply, Brummagem Michael. Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely superb. I've got to say, the readership has really outdone themselves. Thank you, everybody, for emailing in. We have actually had a couple of other emails, but we've simply run out of time. This episode is already very long, but we did get through the Barbenheimer discussion. So thank you, everybody, for emailing in about that. As we said last episode, it's our favourite part of the show. We love hearing from, from the readership, so please do email in with your thoughts on different parts of the show, or if you just would like to introduce us to a topic for us to discuss. We'd love to hear from you. Wait a minute, that sounds familiar, Dan, because I think we now go into a scripted section. So, Simon, what have we learned today? Today, Dan, we learned about Kossipur, oh, yeah. otherwise known as Kashipur, which is the neighbourhood of North Kolkata, which is strange because I'm reading about Calcutta, as it was then, in The Anarchy, which comes up from surprisingly frequently. We had a lengthy conversation about why this podcast might be different. And again, uh, to the readers, I apologise if there's a little bit of ambient noise in uh, in this episode. I can't do much about the traffic in London, much as I have tried. All the clown noises. All the clown, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, bum, bum. we didn't have a choral piece of the week this week. Yeah, shocking. We, 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 we had something different. Emily Barrett Browning. Poetry. EBB. EBB, baby. And we had an extended conversation about what we could do as our version of going to every Margaritaville in the country, <laughs> which we seem to have settled on going to every pub closest to a station on the Bakerloo line in London. But, you know, well, if you've got any ideas, then, you know, we'd uh, we'd love to hear from... Well, wait, I've, I've done it again. Wait a minute. Wait, we've done it again. And that's all for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. Join the Discord. And if you'd like to see our faces, check out our Instagram. Thoughts on Poetry Corner, road trip ideas, and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole. And And we'll we'll see see you you next next time. time. I am not going to fart this time. <laughs> it was such an amazing fart. <laughs> ha ha. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> so good. I played it for, I played it for Pixel Wife and she was just, just like how how has she done how has he done this? <laughs> it was if anything it was it was frightening for me because I don't know how I managed it. But <laughs>